Hey, we're Flick and Joe, and this is our dog, Walter. In 2022, we made the crazy decision to quit our full-time jobs, pack up our lives, and move aboard our blue water sailing boat. We spent many months refitting her and getting her ready for our plans until one day we actually did it. We cast off the lines, we pointed her south, and off we went. We've now sailed over a thousand nautical miles, dodging orcas, yes, actually, and most of the rocks along the way. Join us for the beautiful, quite stressful, but endlessly eventful life that is full-time living aboard. Today's job is to try and do a sort of rig tune on Nandez's mast. And the reason for doing this is because we noticed the other day we were going upwind in like 20 knots, 20 knots of wind. Bo was healing over a good chunk. Nothing crazy though. And the standing rigging on the leeward side, the lower shrouds, were actually saggy. So they were, they were basically had zero weight on them and they were sort of wibbling, wobbling in the wind. So I'd had this book that I bought some time ago, Sail and Rig Tuning. It's a Fanhurst book. The aim is to try and tune the rigging and, and the main re reason for it is it takes the uh, to have like saggy rigging like we had on on the leeward side when you're going at wind it's putting loads of strain on on one side if the mast is unloaded and then loaded you can end up sh sort of shock loading that side that is was totally unloaded the wibbly wobbly side and it's supposed to be really bad for the stainless steel it sort of work hardens it we're gonna we're gonna pre-tension all the wires today, but we have to do it whilst trying to also keep the mast straight. The other reason for doing this is that um, when we were going at wind, we noticed that on one tack we could point really well into the wind and we'd do like decent speed. As soon as we tacked, we'd all of a sudden have to bear away another 10, 15 degrees to get the same speed. We couldn't point at all on one tack versus the other. I imagine that this is something to do, well, almost certainly it's, it's to do with the fact that the mast is not straight on certain tacks because the rigging isn't tensioned correctly. So it seems a shame to leave some performance on the table. We could be going quicker, but with no extra given effort and in fact we could be doing it safer as well because it's putting less stress on the rigging. The first job is to basically loosen off all of the standing rigging so it's only just hand or not even hand just less than hand tight and we're at a really flat calm anchorage today so it's safe to do that. Okay so they're all hand tight now. It's basically impossible to tell how vertical it is by just looking at it so um, there's a handy dandy way we can figure out which is through the power of geometry. So what we do is we hang a heavy weight off of the main halyard. In this case we're using a diesel jerry can and we can compare that see where it sits naturally hangs as a plumb line and compare where it sits versus the top of the mast. This distance here is greater than at the top of the mast up there so that implies that the mast is slightly leaning back in its sort of relaxed state. Um, you can figure out exactly how much of an angle that is with well, through the power of maths. So let me get my book. Using this handy graph, you can figure out what the current mass rake is on your boat. We need two measurements, the P length being the height of the mass from the deck and the B length being the distance between the mast and the shackle on your plumb line or any fixed point you choose to measure from. We have a 13 meter mast. So this is our P length and we measured 26 centimeters as our B distance. Therefore, we have a current mass rake of around 1.25 degrees. 
The ideal mast rate for a masthead rig like ours is between half a degree and one degree. So what does this mean for us? Well, we need to tilt that mast further forwards. We need to reduce the B length. But on a masthead rig, the only really way to do this is to tighten the forestay, a complication of its own for Nondez's rig. To change the tension on the forestay, I have to, I don't have a turnbuckle or anything like that. I don't have an adjuster, so I have to move it one notch. There is a series of pins and I have to, would have to take the forestay off and lower it another pin. So I've put the spinnaker halyard round the whole bow of the boat here and sort of winched some tension on it because all we're going to have to do is take the whole forestay off in order to lower it down one, one pinhole. I'll show you what I mean. So the forestay is attached here. The only way to add more tension onto it would be to drop it down to this hole. So take that pin out, pull the forestay down, and then put it through that pin. I've never done this before and I expect it's gonna be quite awkward. The forestay is gonna be really, really heavy because it's got the weight of the sail on it the roller mechanism plus the weight of the actual forestay, the wire that goes through the middle. So it's going to be a little bit awkward, so I'm going to try and think carefully about how I start this before I just jump into it. I think I need to sort of tie some, I think I need to tie some rope onto the roller mechanism or onto the sail maybe with like a rolling hitch so that I can have a piece of rope that goes from there down to sort of the bow of the boat so it holds the furler mechanism in place because it's on a diagonal so as soon as I let go of take the pin out it's going to want to swing in towards the mast and yeah I don't really want that so I think that's probably a good good place to start. I'm wondering whether I should uh, I'm wondering whether I should take the sail off. Dad, what's the big problem? What's the big idea? Oh, just wrote in something. Okay, top tip here. I started trying to lower the forestay an extra pinhole, but realised I was fighting against a few things. Make sure your rigging really is quite slack, especially the backstay. I'd already loosened them to hand tight, but it wasn't really enough. And also consider lowering your boom. It will take the weight off of the topping lift, which is acting as a lever on the mast. on your thing now. Okay, stop. Do you want me to come and have a look again? at the next pin after lots and lots of jiggery pokery. Like millimeters off. Be careful with those pins. Can you pull uh, the red rope on slightly? Yeah. This pin used to be here. Well, basically, what we've done is we've shoved, put an extra inch of tension on the forestay, and it was very tricky. Yeah. <laughs> we used this uh, pulley 
to try and pull the whole thing forward to pull it all down so we can get this pin in. So I've got to get this washer on and this pin. But um, it's a bit awkward to not drop it back in the sea. Yeah, please don't drop it in the sea. It's actually gone on quite easily. It was really hard to get off. Finally, we've done step one. We've managed to shorten the force day. I feel like that's actually the hardest part of this whole thing because it's probably taking about two hours. I didn't really film a good chunk of it. So hopefully, when we do the test in a second about how straight the mast is, it should be pretty damn straight now. This distance for the fuel can has definitely got smaller. It's about 10 to 15 centimeters. You take that up to 13. We are less than one degree. We're probably about half a degree of mass rake right now. And that's actually perfect. Next step, measure out a two meter length along the backstay and tape the tape measure at that two meter length. So we've got a two meter length of the wire measured out and in theory, we want to put it under 30%. We want to find the max, um, the max limit we should ever tension the backstay to. So to do that, it's generally, well, according to the book, it's around 25 to 30% of the wire's braking strength. To find out what 30% of the braking strength is, you basically can measure the stretch of the wire over a two meter length. So over a two meter length, the wire should stretch by six mil. So what will happen is as we tension this backstay, the end here will just creep up. So instead of the two meter length equaling perfectly on the very end of the wire where it meets the swage fitting, instead it will just sort of creep up and it will be here. And then that means we'll know the max tension we should ever put on the backstay. And after that, we'll then let it off to like two thirds of that. So like four mil of stretch instead. Why do we pre-tension the cap shrouds? Well, this diagram from the book does a reasonable job of explaining it. We go for a sail in a wind where the force is acting on the sails is equivalent to 200 kilos. This is shared equally between either cap shroud. So we now have 100 kilos shared on either side. And you can see how this affects the residual forces in the cap shrouds. The windward rigging is now holding 250 kilos and the leeward is holding 50 kilograms. The leeward shroud will be shortening as the tension decreases, whereas the windward side will be stretching slightly further. As the wind increases, now there's 300 kilograms of wind force. The windward shrouds are now experiencing all of that 300 kilograms of force and the leeward side is experiencing nothing. The leeward cap shroud is effectively okay. hand tight. So all of now. the pretension has been used up. As the wind increases further to 350 kilograms, the same pattern continues. The windward side just continues to have larger and larger forces acting on it, whilst the leeward side is zero. This is an example of not enough pretension. If, for example, there was 200 kilograms of pretension in either wire, then at 350 kilograms of wind force, the leeward side would still be pretensioned with 25 kilograms. It is important that the cap shrouds are pretensioned so that the leeward cap shroud tension only becomes zero when the highest wind forces are experienced. The pretension acts as a shock absorber in variable winds and sea states and it creates masthead stability. It will ultimately protect the longevity of your rigging and your mast. The book recommends marking out your theoretical max backstay tension. Then you release the backstay tension to around 60%, which is about four mil of stretch. And then you mark this too. I used Sharpie pens, but it didn't last all that long before it rubbed off or got faded. Do you guys have another recommendation for permanently marking some stainless steel? So now that we had the rig appropriately tensioned on the forward and aft plane, 
we could concentrate on the port starboard plane instead and the pre-tensioning of the cap shrouds. We repeated the same process as we did just for the backstay, but tensioning each cap shroud to 20% of braking load, which was around 4mm of stretch over a 2 meter section. I actually ended up using a 1 meter section instead and looking for 2mm of stretch. This was much easier to measure out accurately. To make sure the mast is straight on the port and starboard plane, we need to tighten the cap shrouds equally on each side. We can use a halyard to make sure that the mast is dead straight. So what you do is lock off the halyard at a fixed length where it is able to touch the base of the cap shroud on one side of the boat. Now swing that halyard around to the other side of the boat. If the halyard is too tight, then the mast is leaning to port. If the halyard is too loose, then the mast is leaning to starboard. You want the halyard to touch the base of the cap shroud in exactly the same place as the other side and with the same amount of tension in the rope. This is day two of rig tuning. So today we have to go out for an actual sail and we're going to have to sail upwind just in this bay and where there's not much swell but there's still a good breeze. And we have a look at how low the mast is faring on either tack, whether it's leaning or sagging over to one side. And if it is, then we need to tighten the intermediate spreaders and the lower forward and lower aft spreaders. Uh, it's going to involve lots of tacking and a bit of jiggery pokery. Uh. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> What I don't get is why would you ever want an electric winch? Because <laughs> if you had an electric winch on a boat, you'd just do nothing. <laughs> Muddy. See it? Yeah. In you come. Mast. Yeah. This is the main one that goes at the mast. This one should always be tight. Right. Even at 20 to 25 degrees, that's the whole point. And it's a bit saggy now. Um, it's looser. But it's better go looser because the, the, the tension is transferring onto those wires. Yeah. But all of these are a little bit saggy, especially this one. So that's what we now we tighten them up on this one. Then we'll then we tack, and then we tighten up the other side. Yeah. And the aim is to look at the mass and check if it looks straight left to right. Yeah. So I think we'll tack, then tighten it on this side instead. This will be interesting to see because those are tight, a lot tighter than the other side. So we'll see if the mass changes now. Yeah. The intermediates and lowers aren't pre-tensioned to a specific level of stretch like we did for the cap shrouds. Instead, all we do is keep tightening them on opposite tacks until they are tight and there is no sag when on either tack. We must be mindful that when tightening one side, we should also tighten the same side similarly or risk the mast being slightly curved to port or starboard. We're now at the final point of our journey with this rigging. Um, and it was really funny because Joe's obviously spent a ton of time on this. And then, we got like five knots in one tack, tacked and went down to like two and a half knots. It's like, no, it's made it worse. But actually, we think that the angle of the wind measure -er thing is the wrong angle. And that was actually what potentially was causing a lot of the problem. Um, what are your thoughts? Quick, you've got 2% battery. I think we're done. Yay. Good enough out wind sailing for today. Yes, go back in, we can let the sails off and go back downwind now. That sounds nice. Better well. Yes, Dada, thank you so much. Oh. Would you like some lemonade? Yeah, I love that lemonade. Little's finest.